I just want to welcome everybody. I'm Ann Quigley, Program Coordinator here at the Arboretum. And it's been a different year due to the pandemic. We've had to cancel all of our in-person programs, including our annual summer evening lecture series. Um, but we have been able to get several of our speakers who were set to come this summer to join us in this virtual realm. And we're grateful to Rodney Eason, CEO of the Land and Garden Preserve in Mount Desert Island, to be here with us to share a little bit about what's been going on on their property. So we're excited to see some beautiful pictures and learn about some important conservation work. Um, so before I turn it over to our director, Tim Boland, I just wanted to let everyone know that we will do a Q&A at the end of the session. Um, but you can feel free to enter your questions at any time as they pop into your head. Don't feel like you have to wait till the end. Um, and if you are on a mobile device and you don't see the Q&A button, you can tap your dice and it should appear at the bottom of the screen. Likewise, if you're on a computer and you don't see it, if you hover your mouse over the center of your screen or the bottom of your screen, it should appear. So please feel free to enter questions. We'll reserve about 15 minutes at the end of the hour for some discussion. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to our executive director here at Poly Hill Arboretum, Tim Boland. Thanks, Anne, <clears throat> so much for setting this up. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thank you, Rodney, for being here virtually. Next year, we'll get you here uh, in, in total. Um, I did want to just spend a few moments explaining uh, how this lecture came about. It's, uh, it started in 2012 in honor of the contributions and continuing support of the Hope family. A little bit about them and their importance to the Arboretum. Frank and Lucina, who are pictured here, were very early supporters of the Arboretum. And when I say that, actually Frank Hoke in 1997, a year before we became incorporated, was approached by David Smith. And David Smith, as you know, is the co-founder of the Arboretum along with the Hill family. And uh, Frank was asked by David to join the Arboretum, become an advocate. Uh, Lucina and Frank were friends of Polly and Julian Hill. They knew each other very well and they had a, a common interest in plants and science and nature. Uh, and then Frank became our first chairman of the board in 1999. And uh, later, Lucina would join our board in 2005. And continuing to this day, uh, their commitment uh, to the Arboretum in terms of establishing a real legitimate, what I call plant science organization, uh, Martha's Vineyard, one that has local impact, regional impact and national and international impact uh, has been a goal. And so I, I wanted to say early on too, the Arboretum was in a strategic planning process and trying to come up with, you know, our specialized niche in plant conservation. I personally wanted to add it to our mission statement. And uh, Frank and Lucina certainly helped. Uh, they actually invited Dr. Peter Raven, many of you have heard of Dr. Raven, to come and give a talk. And I look back at that, I look back at the Vineyard Gazette today in the archives. It was in 2006 and Dr. Raven's title of his talk, How Many Plants Will Survive the 21st Century? And uh, at the uh, talk, which was held at the Martha's Vineyard Agriculture Society with uh, nearly 300 people there, several of our board members walked away and said, you know, you're right. We really have to get down to the business of saving plants from extinction and telling the story about plants and their importance to our welfare. Uh, very early on as well, they were involved with the initiation of the greenhouse. In fact, I went with both Frank and Lucina to many greenhouses on the island and we came up with a plan to open the greenhouse and have it built. Uh, and we opened it on Polly's 100th birthday, which was in January 2007. 
Uh, the importance of this facility can't be uh, underestimated. It's really opened up the door for us to grow plants from our expeditions. Take a look at these little cryptomeria trees that are back here. And Rodney, these are Yoshino, which I know you, you know that plant um, from Japan, a, a selection. And then today, I actually got a, a little help from Tucker and I went up on the roof of, of the maintenance building to take this photo. And look at those cryptomerias now. Wow. You can see where the, the actual nursery has expanded. This part of the nursery is dedicated to MV wild type plants for uh, people's gardens, native plants and pollinators. And then our collections. So um, early on, this, this really was a, a dynamic uh, game changer and remains that way today. Today we have over 65 plants on our grounds that are red listed and what that means is is that they are under some threat of vulnerability to extinction in the wild. So that's part of our mission. I have this beautiful rhododendron that reminds me of Lucina and Frank. It's called uh, or Cumberlandensi Shalif and it's just a beautiful plant and they always said when that's in bloom call me and I'll come over. Rodney knows this plant from North Carolina, Stewartia malacodendron. And here is a number of 18 different species of plants, red-listed azaleas from a big project. Uh, many of those are going out this fall. Um, I also wanted to talk about a current project just to send us a message to our members. Uh, many of you know the Gayhead Lighthouse was moved, but in the process, this uh, unusual plant, there's only five known populations in Massachusetts, Triosteum perfoliatum, the horse gentian, related to honeysuckle, has these orange fruits that have seeds that are impossible to germinate. <laughs> but we're working on cracking the code. Sometimes it takes three to five years for it to germinate. But in the move, they damaged the populations. And so mm -hmm. the state of Massachusetts and the town of Aquina and the land bank contracted with us to grow this plant. And I can tell you in 2018, we started this project. Here's a stock bed at Poly Hill. Here's some cuttings. Here they are in a rooted mist bench. We've had about 65% rooting. Here's a little cutting just from this year. And this is the first plant down here that's going to be put back in at the Gay Head Cliffs this September. So it's kind of a really cool story. We have 200 more to go though, actually 199. <laughs> so we've got about 50 cuttings here and we will fill three more beds, but this is a success story. And part of why uh, we're involved with plant science. And then just kind of Get talking with Ann a little bit um, about this year with the pandemic. You know, it has been hard on us. We miss uh, the energy of our interns. We miss a lot of our volunteers and we miss a lot of our summer audience who have not come. But we've taken the opportunity to do studies, this benchmarking study on plant conservation and biodiversity, where we look at all of our programming and leadership and governance ex situ conservation growing plants at Poly Hill, the 65 plants I mentioned. In situ conservation is the floor of Martha's Vineyard and the horse gentian is an example of our research and developing expertise. And then we tell our story in the broader story of plants where 20% of all plants globally are under threat of extinction from a changing climate, habitat destruction, those types of things. And I'm happy to report and conclude this intro by saying we scored uh, well on all aspects. In fact, super, uh, super job on uh, all of our uh, areas of biodiversity and conservation. And we're featured uh, on the APGA's website, uh, Excellence in Biodiversity and Conservation. So this work and the work that we're involved with today as a plant science organization is enabled by people like the Hope family that uh, care about conservation. It's the people behind these stories that really matter and make things happen. So I'm so pleased to at least virtually tell this story and share the story of the hoax with you. And I'm also pleased to switch over now um, First of all, again, thank you to the Hope family. Some are participating today. I'm very pleased about that. 
Um, but now I'm going to introduce our guest and my friend. I, I have an insider scoop on Rodney that he, he invited me last year to give a talk. And, and my wife, Laura, and I went to the gardens. And I, I can't tell you it was one of the best trips that we've had. Uh, the, the gardens are incredible. I'll let him tell the story. But I can't wait to go back, Rodney. And and when I do, there'll be a lot of plants in the back seat of <laughs> bring bring some triostium. <laughs> now, have auranticum, which is kind of a cool species up there. Awesome. Um, but Rodney is the chief executive officer at the Mount Desert Land and Garden Preserve, and it has three gardens, really distinct gardens. I'm, he's going to tell you about them. But the other thing, which is really quite amazing, is they're also under the stewardship of 1,200 acres of natural lands, which are adjacent to uh, Acadia National Park. And before I went to visit Rodney in two years ago, I, I went a year before, I hadn't been to, to, to Maine since I was 19, and I, I went to Soam Sound. And I remember jumping in the ocean in August, and it was freezing. <laughs> But um, it, the sky is incredibly blue there and the, the collections and the plantings are, are incredible. And, and Rodney, who's been there since 2012, is, is really uh, got a, a great cast of uh, workers and, and people on his crew, a wonderful team. And you can just tell they're all benefiting from his leadership. Uh, Rodney, before that, arriving there in 2012 with his family was at Longwood Gardens uh, before they moved uh, to Maine. He holds a Bachelor's of Landscape Architecture from North Carolina State, a great uh, horticulture school. With, with a, he has a minor in horticulture uh, and a Master's of Science in Public Horticulture from the University of Delaware and Longwood Gardens. Uh, he's passionate about his job. It was great to talk with him and it's always good to have a couple of beers with Rodney. Uh, and, and nice meals as well. <laughs> He's passionate about uh, his, his workplace in Maine. He, he, you know, for North Carolina, and you really have adapted well to, to the zone difference. Uh, he enjoys uh, going to his kids' sporting events. Uh, I like this, though. He also enjoys starting home improvement projects and riding his bike to avoid finishing those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. That worked, you know, you're just substituting exercise instead of like, you know, digging, digging out a, a hole in your garden or cleaning your gutters. I'm all about it. Well, we have a chicken coop that's been in process for three months and everybody's like, how many chickens do you have? And I go, why get chickens? <laughs> we, cause we, we, this chicken coop, we don't know when it's going to be done. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to start a project, you, you know, at least. Anyway, um, Rodney, thanks for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to your real visit next year and, and hosting you with post pandemic. And uh, in closing, um, again, thanks, Anne, and uh, we're ready to get started. Thanks everybody for joining us. And thank you, Tim and Anne. And uh, I'm gonna share, switch over to my screen now. And okay, and I'll thank you, Tim, and I really appreciate uh, having you and Laura up last year. And just so everyone knows, Tim presented at our annual meeting, which is the sharing of ideas. And some of the ideas that um, that Tim presented actually have, have manifested themselves. You mentioned a strategic plan. We're going to start at the preserve strategic plan next year, as well as undertaking a 10 year physical master plan. And I'll get into that more in just a little bit. Um, speaking of change and master plan, the first thing you see is our new logo. It, this is not live yet. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the preserve, which is an assemblage of different lands and different gardens. And as Tim alluded to, um, we're trying to really uh, do a deep dive and do a forensic analysis of what we've inherited. And so one of the first things is actually telling people that whether you visit Astaku through uh, the Rockefeller Garden or the areas around Little Long Pond, we're all part of one organization. So you'll see this um, new logo, which is emblematic of an, if you're familiar with uh, 
Chinese art. It's called a chop or the maker's mark. And so this is our new logo that will um, go across the preserve. What is the preserve? Um, Anne, can you see my cursor when I move it on the screen? Yes. Great. So I'm going to unmute myself. Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So the up in the upper left hand corner is Astaku Azalea Gardens. It's the smallest of our gardens. And I know there, I'll talk a little bit about the azaleas that grow there. We're, we're USDA zone 6A, which is not analogous to other places of the east coast of the United States. For example, Cryptomeria japonica should be able to grow in USDA zone 6A, but not in Maine. Our winters are too long, and when I say too long, we could go for two weeks where it barely gets out of the 20s, and that type of desiccating cold uh, just will uh, uh, spell the end for so many broadleafed evergreens and marginally hardy conifers. Um, I'm moving down a little bit to Thuya, and Thuya you'll see um, is an assemblage of different plants and I'll explain exactly what that is. Then all of this sort of pink uh, area in the middle is the thousand acres around Little Long Pond, which was donated to the preserve uh, in 2015 by David Rockefeller to celebrate his 100th birthday and the blue area in the middle is Little Long Pond. The Rockefeller Garden, which a lot of you've either been to or heard of, is in the middle. Um, Green Rock is sort of our maintenance hub, and that was just donated to us, gosh, last week. Uh, the paperwork was finalized by the Rockefeller family. It was donated to us, which includes shops. And then I'm going to jump over to the right where I'm speaking tonight is from McAlpin and I'll show you what McAlpin Farm is about. And during uh, Mr. Rockefeller passed away in 2017 and during the execution of his will, we learned that any other property that he held in Maine came to us. So we had uh, also received this area to the right, which is 200 acres of essentially pristine land that goes from uh, Acadia National Park down to Hunter's Cliffs in the Atlantic Ocean, and I'll show you a slide of that. Actually, Tim, Jeff Lynch, and I hiked along these precipitous cliffs um, a couple of years ago, and we found some really cool native uh, campanulas, some, a lot of different variant forms of uh, Solidago sempervirens. So uh, I'm excited to really dig into this property um, going forward. To the north, and you can see there's just a little bit that says Acadia National Park. We're 1,200 acres, and then to the north of us is over 40,000 acres of Acadia National Park. What I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna show you a slide of Northeast Harbor and then jump over here. This is Seal Harbor, and then um, for, as a frame of reference, Seal Harbor predominantly is this area here with a lot of summer cottages, like Martha Stewart has a large property up here on Ox Hill. So that gives you an idea of, it's mainly a summer area. This is Northeast Harbor, um, early, early summer for us, which would be probably right after Memorial Day. You see the moorings are not full. Um, one of the things we've noticed, and I don't know if y'all have seen it on Martha's Vineyard as well, there are so many mega yachts just parked all over the place. I think those who can and, and uh, have a, the means have quarantined on their yachts and are just sailing up and down the East Coast and we've become one of the destinations and I'm guessing uh, Martha's Vineyard has been a destination as well. So moving to the East, this is Seal Harbor, which is again uh, a bit smaller compared to Northeast Harbor. It's a bit, feels more exclusive and this is where I always, <laughs> I always love that tourist joke about, hey, how do they park the boats in the same direction? I'll leave you with that. Um, the founders of the preserve are David and Peggy Rockefeller. Here's a photo of them in the 50s enjoying summer in Maine on their sailboat, the Jack Tar. And they formed the preserve in 1970, actually 1970 into 1971. So we're coming up on our 50th anniversary. And the original intention of, of forming the preserve was to save the Rockefeller Garden, which I'll show you in just a moment. 
But as I go through the presentation, I'll talk about why the preserve has grown in the ensuing 49 to 50 years to include these other gardens as well as the natural areas of the preserve. So let's start with the central part, kind of the keystone to our holdings, which are the natural lands around Little Long Pond. To the north of the property, we're bounded by this cobblestone bridge. And most people think this is part of Acadia National Park. Actually, it is the northern boundary between us and Acadia, and it is in the preserve. This was the first bridge built by David's father, John D. Rockefeller Jr. He didn't actually build it himself. <laughs> he employed teams of laborers um, in the teens and 20s to build these bridges throughout Acadia National Park, as well as over 50 miles of carriage roads. I'll show you in a moment that the preserve actually has roughly one fifth of the carriage roads that are on the island. We have over 10 miles of carriage roads. But again, this was the first, and this was the only bridge built in this fashion. I've heard two stories, one being that uh, JDR Jr. didn't like the aesthetics, the other being the cost. I, I, that's hard for me to believe. Here, you know, the richest man in the world at that time. Um, I, I think it was more the aesthetics of this sort of Adirondack style of these worn river rocks. All the other bridges in Acadia are from cut granite and it's a much different aesthetic. These edging stones here uh, are what you see consistent on the other bridges. This is Jordan Stream below, and Jordan Stream flows down into Little Long Pond. So I just jumped to the south quite a bit, and this is looking back out over Little Long Pond. In the mid-ground, you can see the boathouse, the Rockefeller boathouse that was built by John D. Rockefeller Jr. And in the distance, you see the mountains and the peaks of Acadia National Park. Um, the two small sort of bumps in the middle are called the bubbles, and this, so you can start to make out the ridge here on the right, and that's actually Cadillac, the tallest peak on the eastern seaboard of the, of the U.S. Um, and on nights, if you're walking along Little Long Pond, you can actually see the car lights going up and down Cadillac. So I mentioned the carriage roads. Here are the carriage roads that the crew man maintain around Little Long Pond. One of the things that we have a new uh, natural lands director, Tate Bouchelle, and typically the, Tim had, uh, let me back up, Tim had mentioned that all the conservation programs that Polly Hill, that y'all are doing there, Tate is starting to bring in some conservation programs here. For the longest time, this was just sort of a, an abandoned pasture in the late 1800s, early 1900s. This had been cow pasture land. So really these are mostly European grazing grasses. So Tate is going in periodically and just tilling in the grasses um, and then going back and tilling it again and again and again until he can eradicate the grasses and then adding some native forbs, some native uh, um, perennial plants and increasing biodiversity into these meadows. To the north of the meadow, actually what we see is a large uh, ground cover blueberry barren and um, we're seeing the, the uh, wildlife diversity from Tate allowing these grasslands and meadows to grow. The wildlife is, is going gangbusters. Um, the Rockefellers love having carriage road rides. And so my wife and I, Carrie, were able to go on a carriage ride a few years ago. And it's a pretty spectacular thing. If you've never been able to do a carriage ride at Acadia or at the preserve, um, after COVID, this will be one thing to definitely uh, look to do. It's, it's a remarkable experience and it gets you way up uh, into the in higher level so you can see the landscape from a much different standpoint. One thing that people think with a meadow and they look at this, uh, what we call natural lands, and they assume that we don't do anything. We're pretty fortunate in that we don't have the the, the uh, number of invasive exotics that others do uh, to the south of us. But if you've ever read some of the writings of Michael Pollan, Michael Pollan, um, when he lived in Connecticut, would talk about how the New England forest wants nothing more than for you to plant a garden because it's going to take it over within the matter of a, of a few years. Between white pine and red spruce, they will drop their seeds into the uh, 
into the any kind of organic matter and sprout prodigiously. Here's Ed, our uh, one of our land stewards, and he's gone in and called out some of the white pine and spruce and moosewood maple seedlings. And the reason that he does that is to allow some of the light to penetrate into the forest. If we didn't do if we didn't do some of this um, opening up of the forest. It would just be a dense thicket and not allow those iconic views into the mosses and the lichens that so many people love to see. So again, we use the natural, the term natural landscape in quotes. It does require some gardening, let's say. And then the other thing the crew does is in the fall before snow and, and ice arrive, is they go in and they blow out all the ditches to allow for proper drainage. Where we are, we get our first sort of hard snow that sticks around probably in mid to late December, all that, although that is changing. Um, and then that tends to stick around until probably mid to late March. Some years it can extend until April. So what they wanna do is they wanna get a jump on blowing out the leaves and the other plant biomass out of the ditches. So when the snow and ice melt off the carriage roads, it'll drain quickly. Moving away from the carriage roads, we have over 10 miles of hiking trails. And so one of the things that the team does is they go, go in each year and they assess what we call bog walks. These were built from spruce that were milled on site. But um, we found that spruce doesn't last as long as eastern white cedar, Thuya occidentalis. So the team's now using the eastern white cedar for this bog walk, which will last a decade or more. And here's um, a team working on building a bridge. This is Harbor Brook, which is one of the uh, water bodies that, that goes from north to south through the preserve. And this is a, the formation of a, a bridge that uh, became a hiking trail for a redesigned Harbor Brook Trail. The crew is always looking for different ways to um, cross sort of wet depressions on within the, these hiking trail areas. So what you see here is the Elliott Mountain Trail. This is our board chair's dog, um, Hank, which is a, um, a labradoodle. So our board chair sent me this photograph. So for years, folks just mucked, uh, walked through this muck and mud on the, on the Elliott Mountain Trail. And Tate and his team have um, began and started to insert some of the pink granite to improve the walking surfaces. So, so this, never will, this will never break down like the bog wall. So to back out for a bit, here's a different view of the preserve. And these double green lines are the carriage roads. And I mentioned there are over 10 miles of these carriage roads. The dark black line serves as the boundary and you can see Acadia National Park and how the roads could uh, continue into the park. And the cobblestone bridge is right here at number 24. So that gives you an idea of how that serves as the northern boundary. The red dashed lines are the hiking trails. And we have, again, over 10 miles of hiking trails with, throughout the preserve. And we, we have a, a nice relationship with the park because really we have shared ecologies and in some ways we have shared visitation. The park last year received about 3.5 million visitors. And we get just a small percentage of that. We had, um, Tate installed some digital counters and he estimates we received at least 50,000 visitors to the natural areas last year. And over half of those visitors brought their dogs with them. So we get about 25,000 dog visits each year as well. Here's a view from the Western Meadow looking back over Little Long Pond. I mentioned the boathouse and I'll show you a close up of that in just a moment. And that borrowed landscape from Acadia. When I first started, again, I thought this was multi-flora rose, spending so much time in the mid-Atlantic. If you see a rose coming up in a meadow, you immediately think it's multi-flora. And then after Tate started, he actually identified this as our native rose, the Rosa canadense, and um, is allowing it to grow up and flower a bit more rather than just mowing it. Um, this is taken from the edge of Little Long Pond, and one of the things that Tate's gonna be leading over the coming years is an assessment of the pond um, itself. It flows right into Harbor Brook, I'm sorry, it flows right into Bracy Cove, which is the ocean. And we're anticipating that by 2050, some of our high tides will inundate this 
uh, fresh water. So the pond is fresh water and it's gonna change the habitat. And what we need to do is begin um, developing a resilient landscape. So if that means growing some conservation seedlings from different locations in New England, so that when the native cattails and other plants are wiped out, the rushes, that we have some marginal um, brackish plants that we can introduce to sort of adapt this landscape. Here's the, the boathouse that I mentioned earlier. And I'll show you near the end of the presentation how we have some ideas going forward because we still get, if we don't get consistent snow along the coast, at least we get consistent ice. And so maybe we wanna have a winter carnival in the future and have some ice skating festivals. Another view from the boathouse looking up towards um, Acadia and that's uh, Sargent Mountain. And then a detail of the Chippendale railing that goes around the boathouse itself. One of the things is as Little Long Pond area has become more um, known and more people are using it, they see it as a less crowded alternative to Acadia. And as you know, with the advent of social media and the um, popularity of social media, we're seeing more and more people come. So for example, Tate uh, and his team built this new seating area. And within a week of it um, being completed, up at on the top of this photograph are Martha Stewart's dogs and they're sitting in on this bench. And I showed this uh, photograph, this Instagram photo to, of Martha and her dogs to our dog on the bottom, Rye, who's half Greyhound, half Lab. And he was like, Dad, how come Martha's dogs get to go to your work and you've never taken me? So I had to rush out that afternoon and let Rye occupy the bench as well. Now moving away from sort of the carriage roads and the hiking trails, I wanna take you up towards the landscape that was the Rockefeller Estate and talk a little bit about the Rockefeller uh, Estate, which was called the Irie and, and the garden that is attached to it. So you see these cool um, relationships through the forest. You mentioned, remember me talking about culling out the spruces and the pines and allowing these cool views of these symbiotic tree roots of the spruces. And then you come across these beautiful lichens. And here, the, the pink granite. Um, one cool thing about this, and I don't know if you're familiar with how the, the glaciers carved this landscape. The glaciers on Mount Desert Island were believed to have completely melted about 15,000 years ago. But when they um, sort of went over the landscape, what they did, and you can see the remnant scars, is they would drag along the different stones and, and make these indentations and carvings into the native granite. And then over the ensuing millennia, um, you know, different plant life have been able to occupy this seeming barren, seemingly barren landscape, but it's rich with lichen, it's rich with the different um, uh, mosses, and then you can see a ground cover juniper starting to take over uh, this granite as well. Speaking of granite, um, these are the stairs that would have ascended up to the Rockefeller cottage called the Irie. And this was the original cottage, which was built in the late 1800s. And the, the original cottage was called the Irie and it was built by Professor Samuel Clark. He was a biology professor at Williams College. And this was his summer getaway. So they would travel from Western Mass to Mount Desert Island. In the 1910s, um, the Rockefellers had been summering here for a few years and they ended up purchasing this property, the Irie. And one cool fact we just came across during the transition from uh, the, these properties, from the Rockefellers to the preserve, is we found drawings for, for this original landscape. And believe it or not, the driveway to this, um, to this cottage for Professor Clark was designed by Olmsted Olmsted and Elliot. So not only do we have the Farrand influence in the landscape, but we have some Olmsted and Elliot influence. So again, let me back up to the cottage and you see this gable end and you see this gable end and the Rockefellers did a few additions. So the first gable end is here, the second gable end is here, and they proceeded to add rooms until they had probably about 100 to 110 rooms. They had six children, 
but every child had a tutor, they had a nanny, the family had butlers. So I think the house itself probably employed 30 people just to maintain the home and the kids. And remember, this was largely used in the month of August. The Rockefellers lived primarily in Pecanico, New York. And while they were building this and building um, Acadia National Park, they were also working to build Grand Teton <laughs> out in Wyoming, and they had their own ranch out there as well. So they had a lot of places to escape to. So here's the house looking from the south side, looking back at it. And then here's an aerial view of this um, summer cottage, again, with what is now the preserve and Acadia uh, National Park in the distance. The Irie was torn down in 1962 by David and Nelson. They had their own homes. David was chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, so he was a little busy becoming a global capitalist. And Nelson was governor in New York and had aspirations to become president. You know, he later became vice president of, under a famous Michigander, Gerald Ford, in the 70s. And so they were busy with other things, and so they just documented their parents' home and had everything torn down. But they left the terrace out front, and so one of the things we're slowly opening is the terrace, and, and Tim and Laura have, have been able to visit this and see these majestic views you have to the islands south of Mount Desert Island and this beautiful landscape off in the distance, including the Atlantic Ocean. Here's that same round area in the prior photo and this view from one of the porches of the Rockefeller um, cottage to Irie. And again, the view off into the distant landscapes. And here's what that looks like today. I'm gonna to take a walk down towards the Rockefeller garden. And as we make our way from the Irie, this is the pathway that goes down below the house. The house was perched on this beautiful granite. And again, this granite was, you'll see this throughout the island if you haven't been before, how everything's pushed and pulled due to the glaciers. And this is what that looks like today. Um, one of the cool things, and I'm not gonna get too deep into it, but you see these worn glacial um, landscapes at about the same elevation, roughly 250 to 300 feet above what is sea level today. And the reason why was when the glaciers were thickest, they actually depressed the entire island plate down. So what we're looking at today would have probably been the edge of the ocean um, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years ago. And then as you sort of, I'm gonna transition hard here, as you make your way up above the garden, you see me with two 11,000 gallon water tanks. And these actually supply the water to the garden itself. So water is pumped up roughly um, 250 feet from the main road, and then they fill these two tanks, which I think they just borrowed the engineering from New York City tenement buildings and then put them up, up above the garden. Speaking of the garden, here in the foreground is an aerial view of the Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller Garden. Those tanks would have been over here to the left. The iery would have been sort of in the area where I'm moving my cursor now. Here's a little long pond to the right, and then you can see the surrounding islands. If any of y'all are from Texas, um, there's a gentleman by the name of Charles Butt who owns HEB grocery stores. That's his uh, sailboat there, uh, Rebecca, that you see there in the midground. The Rockefeller Garden surrounded by this uh, pink Chinese wall with yellow tile. It was inspired by a trip that John D. and Abby took in the 20s um, to P Peking when they commissioned the, um, the medical hospital there in Peking. Excuse me, I was just taking a drink of water. And the ironic thing is, I mentioned this last week, I was given a, a tour to the head of the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Foundation, Dr. Narav Shah, and he said it's funny that that relationship between the Rockefellers and China still exists because the foundation's working hard to develop some resiliency to COVID. And they're actually collaborating with the Chinese hospitals on some of the um, treatments that are undergoing now in Wuhan and other areas of China. 
And those were relationships that were initially built by the Rockefellers in their travels in the early 1900s, which is pretty cool. Anyway, sorry to digress. As you go into the south uh, entrance into the garden, you're, you're met by the south gate. And again, this was inspired by the Rockefellers and designed by Beatrix Farrand, who was um, the first female landscape architect as well as the designer of Dunbarton Oaks and the Princeton campus. If we were to open these doors, you walk in and you're greeted by the spirit path. And along the way, there are these Korean statues. The first two are warriors, which guard your spirit against evil spirit. And the remaining are these uh, priests, which uh, help sort of pray and give you good blessings. The Rockefellers were not Buddhist. Uh, they were, uh, Mr. Rockefeller was a, a Baptist. And Mrs. Rockefeller was, I think she was more intrigued by the idea of, of theism and different religions around the world. Here's a close up of one of the warriors holding this sort of anthropomorphic dragon sword, again, warding off the evil spirits. And as you make your way near the end, you're greeted by this uh, amazing sort of moss line reel. And what this serves as is functional. All the drainage from the garden actually flows through this rill, goes over the hill, and actually winds up in Little Long Pond. You make your way from this natural landscape, and one really amazing thing that Farron did is she transitioned this Asian-inspired landscape using Maine natives. For the most part, these are either moosewood maples, native ferns, blueberries, Cornus canadensis, uh, native mosses, and she sort of used this as inspiration and then you transition into a totally different landscape as you go through this keyhole or bottle gate. First you come across this rectangular pool and kids love this because giant bullfrogs love hanging out around this pool every summer. And so one thing the team has to do is they have to re-sod the edges of this pool because kids wear it down and adults every summer. And then you turn around, you do a 180, and you're greeted by the sunken cut flower garden. And the intent is to have this feel that there was this English garden sort of plopped in the middle of the main woods. When it was originally designed, Farron had a pathway going down the center of it. And you can see that what's now turf were these um, flowers. The Rockefellers envisioned this as a cut flower garden for their 110 room mansion. And after a few summers, they realized, hey, we're only here a year. We don't need this many cut flowers. So they scaled back the operations. Here's a drawing by Farron. And if, if you're an aficionado of garden design, you can see the influence of Gertrude Jekyll on her layout and just the planting masses themselves. When they were laying out the north wall and what we call the moon gate there, uh, you can see the full scale mock-ups uh, um, before they went into, into construction. And here's what it looks like today. There was a red spruce which served as the major axial point for the garden. And it was finally removed after so many years of rot and decay. But it gives us this, this amazing view of one of the two bronze Buddhas that serve as the sort of terminal points of both the major and the minor axis of the garden itself. In the summertime, everybody goes, how do you do the delphiniums? How do y'all do the delphiniums? And again, we have this amazing sort of climate that is not too cold. I mean, for me being from North Carolina, it is wicked cold, but you go inland Maine probably two hours and they'll get minus 20, minus 25 Fahrenheit in the winter and we might get to minus five or minus seven at most. And then in the summers, you go inland and they're not moderated by the maritime climate. In the inland around Bangor, they may see 85, 95 in the middle of summer, whereas we rarely get to the mid eighties. This year we did see 90 a few times, which was um, everybody loves to complain about something. So they complained about the heat. But the delphiniums, you know, really look good. And I showed this slide to my friends down south when they go, hey, man, when are you going to grow? When are you going to move back to North Carolina where we can grow these zone eight um, woody plants? And I go, hey, man, I, I'm cool with these delphiniums. I love it up here. Here's a view of the cool side. And I mentioned the cool side. The garden is sort of separated by colors. To the west are the 
the pastels and the cooler colors. And on the right hand side, and this is the eastern side, you start to pick up the yellows and the oranges. And this, was, this shot was taken last summer. And then a few, I mentioned to Tim earlier that our board has gotten together socially distant with masks a couple of times this summer. And two weeks ago, we got together one evening and everything was perfect. It was like one of those perfect main summer evenings where the sky, the clouds, everything just looked really great. And one thing I'll point out as well, see this V notch? So the team goes in in the winter and they intentionally cut trees because we want to maintain this vista of Penobscot Mountain at Acadia National Park off in the distance to remind you that, hey, you're in this beautiful garden in the Maine woods, but you're also a part of this overall Acadian landscape. Quick shot of the garden. Here's that cross axis that I alluded to. And then you, if you make your way up into the woods, you'll see the other Buddha up on the East Hill. And we've allowed the, I mean, the gardeners go in and they want to make sure that the moss is maintained. And we also use the moss as kind of this litmus test to determine are too many people visiting the garden. So if this moss gets worn down too much, we will cut back on the number of visitors we have each year. I'm going to move along quickly. So let's leave the Abbey Garden and we're going to move over to where I'm speaking from tonight, McAlpin Farm. Tim talked about the production that you are doing at Polly Hill. We've got glass houses here, again, that originally were used for growing plants for the garden. But now that we've really begun, increased our focus on our natural lands and restorations, we're starting to do restoration planting as well, um, or restoration growing in the greenhouses. This area you see here, this is a fenced in garden. And it originally was a cut flower vegetable garden for the entire Rockefeller, Rockefeller family. So in essence, before it became a part of the preserve, it was a private CSA funded by David Rockefeller. And the only way you could get a share was to be born into the Rockefeller family. So we've got this area over an acre within a deer fence, and we're beginning to transition over to, um, to do some trial plantings as well as restoration plantings. Here's a, the propagation house in the spring where you see John, our lead growers, uh, is doing some cuttings. And then in the fall, one of the plants, I mean, we cannot grow tropicals like dahlia, I'm sorry, we can't grow tro tro uh, tropicals like cannas and elephant ears, but we can grow dahlias. And what the crew does is after hard frost, they dig them up and you hear, here you see they're drying on one of the benches. Now I want to shift to the story about the other two gardens, Astaku and Thuya, and, and this common commonality that's shared between all three gardens of Beatrix Farron. On the left was her garden, Reef Point, which was in Bar Harbor. And she had gotten a lot of the plants for her garden from Charles Sprague Sargent, the first director of the Arnold Arboretum. And she realized that, hey, most people think Maine is good for growing junipers, blueberries, and spruce, but she saw that due to the ocean that, and being on an island, we were a little moder more moderate than people thought. So she would get plants from the Arnold and grew them on, in her garden in Bar Harbor. Well, after this big fire in 1947, and then Mrs. Farron's husband, Max, passed away, she realized she had to, she had to sell this garden. So she sold Reef Point along with all the plants and the plants were getting ready to be bulldozed. And these two gentlemen stepped in. On the right is Charles Savage. At the time, Savage was trustee of Thuya, um, which was not a garden at the time, but he was trustee of Thuya. This is a picture of him standing on a, a cart path in the middle of what was the burned out forest after the fire of 47. And on the left is John D. Rockefeller Jr. looking like Steve Jobs in his black turtleneck. So what Rockefeller did is he wrote a letter to John, I'm sorry, what Savage did is he wrote a letter to John D. Rockefeller Jr. and said, hey, it's going to require about $5,000 to move all the plants from Mrs. Farron. And again, re remember, Farron had designed not only the gardens at, um, for the Rockefellers, but had helped landscape the carriage roads through Acadia. 
So he said, we should keep these plants. I know exactly where we can move them. Would you mind being sort of my uh, venture capitalist on this? He, Rockefeller wrote back and said, I'm your silent partner. Here's a check. Now get moving. And they started moving the plants. And you hear, you can see an old tow truck, which has been converted into a, um, a tree mover where they would fall and burlap and dig some of the rhododendron and initially move them to Thuya. And Thuya was this garden up on top of the hill above Northeast Harbor. Here's one of the calmias um, that was moved from Reef Point into Thuya. And once they moved all the plants, they realized they needed a deer fence. And so Savage brought in his cousin, Gus Phillips, who was a fine boat builder. And he used local, the Thuya Occidentalis and created these amazing, not only the amazing fence, but these amazing gate carvings that are still extant today um, that we put up during the open season and then these are stored, or stored away each winter. Savage um, had it, was entrusted with Thuya, which was actually built originally by Joseph Curtis in the early 1900s. And this is Curtis's sort of summer cottage. He was called a rusticator and that was the movement of the time where people wanted to get away from Boston in the summer and enjoy the cooler temperatures of Mount Desert Island. And so we keep Thuya Lodge the way that Curtis would have kept it in the early 1900s today. It's closed this year due to COVID, but we're hoping that in years to come, we can open it back up to the public. When Savage was entrusted with maintaining the landscape, none of the, gar none of the gardens were here, but Savage was uh, inspired by the works of Gertrude Jekyll as well as Beatrix Farron. And he designed this double border in the 50s using this backdrop of the rhododendron and some of the thuya and the calmia and, and um, I'm drawing a blank on some of the other plants that were moved from Reef Point to thuya itself to serve as this backdrop. I'm going to go through some of the borders now which are looking amazing this year. One of the things we found, we haven't been able to open as much to the public, but it's given the gardeners more time to focus on gardening and the borders are responding brilliantly. Here's just some more shots across the landscape. And being a small garden, the gardeners have time to look after the, the details. Every day, every morning before we open to the public, they go in and rake these decorative pathways in this pink crushed granite. So if you're lucky enough to be one of the first visitors to any of our gardens, you can see how the staff really do an awesome job, even attending to the small details. Some uh, close-ups of the plants. The head gardener at Thuya, her name's Wendy, so I always love showing Salvia Wendy's Wish, when the helianthus. Um, the peonies that come into flower, and this is sort of early summer for us, which would probably be again the second week of June. Again, the maritime climate, and you probably see it there on, on Martha's Vineyard, it holds back summer, whereas the mainland experiences summer a few weeks ahead of us. I mentioned dahlias. Here's inter, uh, intermingling between a dahlia and a salvia. Another dahlia. A really cool amaranth within the border. And then um, a monarch butterfly. And, and uh, Ann mentioned earlier that one of your speakers coming up is Andy Brand, who knows butterflies in and out, and he's going to give you all a great talk about them. But one thing about Thuya itself is it's a monarch way station, W-A-Y. So it, it, it provides both food and um, pollen uh, nectar for the plants, so for the, for the butterflies, for the monarchs to reproduce as they make their way north and then also as they make their way south. So it's, we make sure that we treat this garden organically and actually all parts of the preserve we treat organically as well. You can see some of the mosses and lichens. And then there's this abrupt transition between the garden itself and then you sort of on your own onto these hiking trails. And then the, I mentioned the gardens up on the hill and you make your way down these terraces and here's an overlook over Northeast Harbor in these amazing uh, stone steps that were made under uh, the watchful eye of Charles Savage in the 30s and 40s. Here's a crew working on a, um, a landing on Northeast Harbor. 
this probably would have been in the 30s when they didn't have to worry about permitting and other regulations of whatnot. So they're just down there working above the high, high tide mark, putting in this um, landing and float. And this is what it looks like today. So I'm gonna shift over to Astaku really quickly. So when, when Savage started building Thuya, he realized, wow, Farron has a lot more plants than I have room at Thuya. So his family had this area across from the inn that they owned, the Astaku Inn. And he thought, why don't we build a stroll garden? It was about three acres. So again, before the days of permitting and whatnot, they just started using dump tr trucks and filling in the edges of this small pond. And then as they moved the plants in, this is what it would look like in the spring today as it's grown in over the ensuing 50 plus years. You can see the beautiful reflection. Tim talked about azaleas. I'll go through some of the azaleas and rhododendron featured in this garden. And again, these narrow pathways in the rate gravel. I talked about the fire of 47 and how so many uh, large estates were burned down uh, in Bar Harbor. And so what locals did is they salvaged pieces. These plants that are in the stream were actually taken from the bases of columns on one of the destroyed estates in Bar Harbor and now serve as a way to get from sort of the western part of Astaku over towards the sand garden. You see these little vignettes and are those Kyushianum? I'm horrible remembering the names. Here's a shot back in the spring. Astaku is super popular at the end of May, early June when all the azaleas are in flower. And this year we had to leave the deer fencing up to control the number of people who could enter into the garden. And I thought, how, I gotta take a photo of this. Plein air painters in masks. And if anything says 2020, you will look back on this time and go, why, you know, the next generation will go, why were people wearing masks and painting at the garden? And we'll be able to tell them about 2020. So going real quick through some of the plants, rhododendron calendulaceum, this is Hong Kong, which is one of the large trust rhododendrons. Um, rhododendron canescence, which is fun because I, I, I looked up Fred Galley's book and Fred Galley mentions that rhododendron canescence is from the Southeastern United States and it should not be growing in the Mid-Atlantic, much less on an island off the coast of Maine. And that just goes to prove that plants do not read the books. So be daring and try new things as Polly did and as Tim and others continue to do there at, at Poly Hill. This is one of the Ghent hybrids. And one of the things that we're gonna be doing over the coming years is going back and tracing the provenance of these plants and figuring out exactly, is this a Ghent hybrid? And if so, which Ghent hybrid is it? Um, to, speaking of natives, underused natives, Pieris floribunda, it is, and uh, Tim talked about triostium, which is difficult to propagate, and as is this Pieris floribunda. The Molly, Molly the Witch peony, which folks love when it's in flower in the garden. And the gardeners tie up the seed pods with this raffia because if they don't, what will happen is as those, as those sort of immature seeds develop and turn the dark, sort of dark blue, um, they'll drop. And so they try to, to keep them tied up to keep them intact. And the other thing it does, believe it or not, it, it keeps the sort of errant hands of uh, youthful gardener admirers from, from pinching off the seed because we like to collect the seed and sow it. One of the anemones tucked in, Darmera peltata, which is one of my favorite. Again, we can't grow bold tropicals, so we go to these sort of real unusual bold plants in the landscape. Probably my favorite rhododendron, the rhododendron Yakushimanum from Yakushima Island. Again, another plant from southern Japan, which should be growing on Mount Desert Island in Maine, but does. And here you can see the fuzzy indumentum on the top of the leaves once they emerge. Inchianthus grows like gangbusters. There's small trees on the, on the island and in Astaku. And Tim showed the Stewardia malacodendron, and here's the Camouflage bark, always in, in fashion of pseudo camellia. Just show you one of the Zen views in Astaku. And Savage had never visited Japan. 
but he was inspired by books that he saw of Sahoji in other gardens. The sand garden, which actually we're gonna start next week on a complete restoration of this garden. It was built in 58, so the stone wall needs to be replaced. There's a cedar fence that needs to be replaced. And we had to track down where exactly white sand, and we were able to find it in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. You wouldn't believe how hard it is to find this pure white sand for the sand garden. And then the garden has a second season in the fall. Um, we're gonna actually uh, uh, keep the garden open on weekends during the pandemic, just so folks can get this glimpse of fall color. And then if you like me, you love the Katsura tree, not only for the fall color, but also that whether you describe it as cotton candy or caramelized sugar, just that unmistakable smell of the Katsura tree. Now I'm gonna close with showing you what we're doing to sort of bring everything together. I talked about, you know, the different parts of the preserve. And some people still don't understand that Astaku is part of the preserve, Thuya is part of the preserve, that the Rockefellers gave the garden to us as one organization. We're all on the same team now. So we have a new mission that we developed in 2017. We're working on the last year of our strategic plan. I mentioned we're gonna start on a new master plan and I'll show you why. We've inherited some pretty remarkable assets. And at the end, Hopefully within five years, as Tim alluded to earlier, folks will realize that the gardens, the landscape, everything's all part of one incredible landscape. Here I am a few years ago leading a strategic planning session with one of our uh, supporters, um, sorry, in one of their summer uh, cottages. We were working in the winter and doing some strategic planning. These are our staff directors, Tate Bouchelle there, Chris. So Tate is our natural lands director. Chris is our director of finance. Cassie, who has an enviable job to oversee all of our gardens and production, and she does an awesome job. And, and Jesse here, who's our director of facilities. And Catherine took the photo, who's our director of development. Um, one of the things that um, we'd love to do after COVID is get everybody back together again. And here's one of our uh, summer festivals. I talked about the patio and we were, here's our crew getting together and having drinks at the end of summer in August. And we look forward to being able to do that again and develop this culture of shared teamwork and also being able to celebrate. One of the things we've done during the pandemic um, while we have all these plants and we haven't had as many people visiting our gardens is a crew has gone in and cut flowers both from the gardens as well as our production farm and we've taken these flowers every friday to the local food bank and so not only are people getting food that they need but they're getting some of the beauty of the preserve that they can take back home with them into that they need i mentioned earlier and i'm just going to show you this quick video that our board chair found from 1927, where around Little Long Pond, the community actually came out in mass and used it as a place to celebrate. So here you see Little Long Pond covered by snow and ice, and just the number of people who would come out and go tobogganing and cross country skiing. And that person wiped out half the town there. We don't see people do this. And this is one thing we wanna to try to foster amongst the community is get out and enjoy the winter. Um, I mentioned to Tim that, you know, we're seeing more people buy property here in Maine, especially during the pandemic as a place to escape cities. So maybe we'll see more people using this landscape during the winter and sledding down the hill and doing other fun things during the winter. I don't know if y'all remember ABC Wild World of Sports where the guy fell off the jump. That always reminds me of that. I mentioned master plan. So we inherited this amazing playhouse from the Rockefellers. When they built the Irie, they also built a playhouse with a two lane bowling alley, a living room. There are two squash courts not pictured. But how do we use this? Could we use this as a venue to have, you know, speakers come in and talk about plant restoration or other ways and just have small gatherings. We also have this rest house that the Rockefellers used. Essentially the Rockefellers used it when, when the house was full of 
family and guests. John D. Jr. and Abby would use this as a place to get away and just read during the middle of, of the day. Um, so we inherited this little bedroom, and I'm thinking, um, sorry, little two-bedroom cottage right beside the Rockefeller Garden. I'm thinking we should do a fellowship program like the McDowell Colony where, let's say, Tim Boland needs a break. And so he applies to do this two to three week sabbatic leave on Mount Desert Island where he can just refresh his thoughts and then come back with another five years of gangbuster ideas for Polly Hill. So these are the sort of things that Tim didn't say me, ask me to say that. That's just something that we're starting to think about we could do at the preserve. Earlier, I talked about the additional acreage that we inherited from Mr. Rockefeller. And this is that area that Tim, Jeff Lynch, and I sort of traversed the cliff face looking at different plants that grow in this, e this ecosystem. This is Park Loop Road in Acadia National Park. This gives you an idea of just how amazing this landscape is. And then as you make your way through, you see these incredible rock formations tucked away. I mentioned the new look and feel of the preserve. All of this, these style guides of colors and fonts and logos and photo imagery, all this is getting prepared behind the scenes. So come 2021, you'll see a totally new look and feel of the preserve itself. So I'm gonna end, Tim mentioned swimming in ice cold Somme Sound. This is Somme Sound with a sunset over Acadia and St. Savoir Islands. And with that, I'm gonna open it up to questions from the group. All right, that was wonderful. Thanks, Rodney. You're welcome. So our first question is, this may be a question for Tim, will PHA plan a visit to Acadia in the future? Tim, you're on mute. Hi. Yes, well, it sounds like I'm going there first on the scholarship, but <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think it would be a really great trip um, and it wouldn't be hard to get there. Uh, from from where we are, of course, we have the boat to deal with. But no, I think we could get a couple of van loads to to go, and uh, we could spend probably three days there, at least. Yeah. Not only that, but the the just the sheer number of private gardens. Um, you know, I, I, Philadelphia loves to bill itself as the garden capital of the U.S., but a lot of the folks with the gardens in Philadelphia have summer gardens up here, so it's not just to preserve. As Tim knows, there are a lot of other places to see. You were welcome. Um, are there accommodations within your preserve um, or in Acadia? Uh, during a normal year, the preserve does not. And that's something we're gonna look at with the master plan. And Tim and I lamented when he spoke last year just about the cost of living on um, Martha's Vineyard. And it's not as, ex it's not as exorbitant here on MDI, but it, but it is. Um, there are places you can camp in Acadia, but during, due to COVID, most of the campgrounds are closed. Do you sell seeds? Not yet, not yet, but that's a great, a, a great question. Um, again, inspired by Tim's talk, um, we were going to roll out and we had everything ready to roll out a plant sale this fall, but we, we just nixed it and we ended up giving away a lot of plants to our top level members um, since we were, weren't able to give member benefits. But hey, if we do an index seminum, um, it's something that we definitely would want to consider. All right, this is a question from me. Do you have an interpretive plan for your grounds? Do you have a lot of signage? What are the ways in which you incorporate education into the landscape? Yeah, great question. Um, that's going to fold into the master plan. One of the things that developing this new 
look and feel what I showed you the logos and whatnot. The, the, the current signage is an amalgamation of different people taking a slab of cedar and carving the name of a gardener trail in it and the fonts don't match. So what we want to do is as we go through the master plan itself is develop a comprehensive interpretive plan. And one of the things that we want to make sure we don't do is over sign the landscape because it's, you know, you'll see when y'all come and you bring your van loads, you'll see that, you know, sh should we put signage in the landscape is a big question moving forward. It sounds like it's going to be great. Um, that's exciting that you've got new branding happening. Um, what fertilizers did you use in Thuya Garden? Great question. Um, gosh, Tim, help me with the name of it. It used to be Daniel's Plant Food, but then Nature's... Yeah, is it Nature's Way or...? It's something like that. It's an organic liquid feed is what we use. It's, it, you can smell it. <laughs> yeah. Is it humic acid? Is it like a seaweed based thing or can't remember I, make that? Yeah, I think it's, it, it is a, 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 and a fish, a fish so, solution of some sort. Fish emulsion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so this person's wondering about how to find you online, your website, any other um, social media channels and best way to become a member if you do accept members at the preserve. Yes, um, go to gardenpreserve.org, that's our website. And um, in terms of our social presence, the, we're slow, and I'll tell you that because given the culture of the Rockefeller family, we are a bit introverted and it, manifests itself into our social channels. Um, so don't expect us to post a ton of information, but we're slowly ramping that up. You're on Facebook and Instagram and we are tweetless. I think we'll remain tweetless. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Except for the birds on the preserve, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and Thank you for that. <laughs> And how about um, membership? Yes, great. Sorry, sorry, I skipped over that. If you go to right there on our homepage, there is information about becoming a member of the preserve and the different categories and the, and the different levels of membership. All right. And we've got a question about whether membership is reciprocal with PHA, which I believe it is, as long as you all are part of the American Horticultural Association. I, I, can't, I can't answer that question. We, we can follow up with the answer to that question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Astaku and Th I will tell you this, Astaku and Thuy are free and have, have always been the natural lands are free by donation only, the only garden that we require, have required an admission entry fee is the Rockefeller Garden, which we waived, we waived this past year due to the pandemic. Um, and Mark Fournier, who runs my toy garden here on Martha's Vineyard on Chappaquiddick, just jumped in to say he believes the fertilizer we were referring to is called Neptune's Harvest. So I'm not sure if that's the one you guys were thinking yeah. of, but for <laughs> that is, that's for one of them. And, okay. and I know the gardeners have a preference. Um, it, it's not Neptune's, but I, I, Mark, I know which one you're talking about. For some reason, the gardeners don't prefer this other one, which used to be Daniel's. Um, I think that's it for the questions. So if anyone thinks of questions after the fact, feel free to email info at polyhillarboretum.org. Um, and we thank you, Rodney, for your time and the stunning photographs. It really felt like we were there. <laughs> yeah, it, it was great. And, and you did just such a wonderful job narrating the different areas and you I felt, you know, I've been there, obviously, but I feel like 
our participants today really get a sense of not only the history of the place, but where you're going and how, how you're opening up, which is really amazing. So we will come and see you definitely. And uh, we're so appreciative. And let me tell you, if you want me to reciprocate and give a, a, a real boring talk uh, about some plant group, maybe Stewardia, I, I'm willing to do that for your crew or your membership. Just let me know. Absolutely, and you, yeah, it, uh, <laughs> you're funny. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, all. Thanks to everyone who joined. We'll see you on the next lecture. My best to your family, Rodney, and stay healthy and safe. Likewise. Yeah, take care. <laughs>